Hello, my name is Jeffrey Tucker. I work for the Mises Institute, and it's my pleasure to sit here today with Professor Mark Thornton, who's the editor, co-translator of a new book, Essay on Economic Theory by Richard Cantillon, who lived before the time of Adam Smith and wrote a wonderful treatise. The Mises Institute has just published a new translation. Welcome, Professor Thornton. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Tell us um, first a little bit about Richard Cantillon. Okay, Cantillon is a very mysterious character. He comes from Ireland, uh, County Kerry. Uh, his family lands had been taken by the Protestants, and so he and his brother left to go to Paris to find work and to find a livelihood. And he ended up in his uncle's bank and eventually taking over his bank, uh, making it very profitable. Uh, he was tapped by John Law to be uh, a director of the Mississippi Company. This is and John Law of the famous uh, Mississippi inflation. Bubble. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And Cantillon uh, was a very bright person, and he actually made money on the stocks as they went up. Uh, he made money by selling them short on the way down. And he also made money in a currency transaction, taking advantage of changing values of different currencies. So he's a very brilliant uh, uh, person, uh, lived all over Europe, and um, made a lot of money. And when did the, the book come out? During his lifetime? Uh, no, it did not. He, it's written, we think, around 1730, and it was not published until 1755, which was long after his death. Uh, he was supposedly murdered in 1734. Uh, others have come to doubt that, and, and his biographer has suggested that he faked his own death to get away from various lawsuits. You know, just as today, when you see a bubble and a bust and somebody making money off of it, everybody wanted to sue Cantillon to get part of his money back. So it was written around 1730. It circulated in Europe amongst his friends and colleagues uh, until it was finally published in 1755, and that was brought about by the physiocrats who had gotten a copy of it. Um, had it published under very mysterious circumstances. It was anonymous. Uh, it was supposedly published by a publishing house that had gone out of business. And so everywhere you turn in Cantillon, you find mysteries. Mm -hmm. And uh, what did he look like? Well, we don't know. <laughs> That's the one thing I'm working on right now as we speak is is to try to find an image that I think I have found. Uh, oh. But there's no pictures or representations um, of him as a man. There's a few uh, written descriptions. But other than that, we don't have anything official quite yet. You're right. Okay. Well, we look forward to getting a first glimpse of Richard Cantillon. Working on my art history right, <laughs> right. now. Why do you, what, what was in the book that was so uh, controversial? Or is, that, or is that why the publication was so delayed? Uh, well, it was delayed because of censorship laws. Uh, in France at the time, uh, you had to get government permission. And, you know, economics is something that very often government likes to cover up. Uh -huh. And this is really the first book ever in, in terms of economic theory. And so he wasn't interested in publishing it. It would have only gotten him in more trouble. And so the censorship laws were relaxed around mid-century, around 1750. And so the physiocrats who had public standing thought that this was the time to bring it out. Um, you said it was the first book on economic theory. Is that really the case? Yeah, that's really the case. Uh, I mean, there's economics that's going on prior uh, to Cantillon, but most of it was mercantilist, which is not really economic theory mm. to speak of. It's economic policy, and it's mostly misguided economic policy. You can get some good economics if you go back to the scholastics, but again, it's not really economic theory per se. From uh, first page to last, uh, scientific treatment. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's what you find in Cantillon. Uh, it's not unlike a good uh, book on economic theory today. I mean, he starts off with the very basics and goes through price theory and develops it systematically until you get to the end of the book where you've gone through production, uh, distribution, price theory, monetary theory, banking, which was all brand new and ending up with business cycle theory. So it's all there, uh, systematically laid out, 
uh, from the very basics to the most complex things. And this is why why Rothbard called him the founding. What did he say? The founder founder of modern economics. I guess was his phrase, right? Yeah, that's correct. And actually, Murray's uh, essay on uh, Cantillon is what really got me interested in in the first mm-hmm. place. Uh, and uh, Murray had uh, not only great descriptions of what was in Cantillon, but also a lot of the mysteries and his um, his observations about what he thought uh, was would resolve those mysteries. And so I wrote about Cantillon for the book 15 Greatest Austrian Economists. Oh, yeah. And then I spent about the next 10 years uh, trying to unravel those mysteries in detail, the type of detail that Murray didn't have time to do. And as a matter of fact, I mean, I wouldn't have had time to do it if I had a regular academic job. I mean, if I wasn't working at the Institute and having the time to put into those kind of mysteries and into the translation itself, which took six years to complete, um, and I had the assistance, of course, of uh, Chantal Saussier, who's a French translator, um, none of this would have ever come to be. And I can assure listeners that uh, that Dr. Thornton has been absolutely obsessed. I can, I yeah, can. <laughs> you, you could say that. <laughs> Tracking down, you know, sometimes I would, we would spend um, a couple of days trying to unravel the meaning of a single sentence or a single mm-hmm. paragraph. And very often we'd have to come back and revisit it because, you know, we would only find the clues to unravel it later on in the text. Mm-hmm. And so we we used the original French. We used the English translation by Henry Higgs in 1931. Mm-hmm. That's the only other translation available, right? That's correct. Well, there's also a German translation by Hayek and his wife. And we consulted uh-huh. that in a couple of instances to see what Hayek had to say mm-hmm. about particular points. And so we had a good set of data to work from um but still there's a lot of uh a lot of mysteries that were uh seemingly took forever to unravel and uh there was a case where he discusses uh, a, a landowner building canals and terraces on his property and uh we couldn't really figure that out uh, what he was talking about there until we ran into a a book on 18th century french uh landscaping and what that actually involved was um, lowering the level of land further away from your house and raising it to a flat level closer to your house so that deer and other animals couldn't jump up into your garden and eat all your plants and flowers. Mm-hmm. And it was a common technique back then, but Higgs's translation led you to wonder what in the world was going on. Yeah. Yeah, it seems very strange. Well, then, of course, you have the other issue that Cantillon was the founder of the of the of the um, notion of entrepreneurship. You could say in economic theory, and yet the term doesn't appear in the old English translation. That's correct. Adam Smith and Henry Higgs, who translated the uh, Cantillon's essay in 1931, both used the word undertaker. And so that's just one instance, but it's a repetitive one where the reader is faced with a term that just isn't the correct meaning. And so one of the most obvious changes that we made is to put entrepreneur back right. into the book. Because he, I mean, that is one of the key contributions that uh, Cantillon made. It's his whole system of economics yeah. is built on the entrepreneur. Nothing moves, nothing ever comes about in terms of economic theory if you take the entrepreneur out of the equation, so to speak. You know, we talked about this a couple of days ago, and in the meantime, I, I should have asked at the time, but uh, 48 hours have gone by, and only now am I puzzling uh, as to how it came to be that the word undertaker was replaced entrepreneur. <laughs> what is the poss- what possible relationship could there be between these two terms? Well, the, the, the word entrepreneur, and we're, we're doing some research on this, but the The original meaning of entrepreneur was somebody who was a government contractor who built forts and who built bridges and things of that Mm -hmm. nature. Then it became more of a general notion of just somebody who undertook various projects. Ah, And it was Cantillon who redefined the term to mean somebody who bought in the present at fixed prices but sold in the future at uncertain prices mm. and therefore faced uncertainty and risk mm-hmm. where the government contractor then and now of course does not face yeah. risk uh they get a you know they get their money under all conditions so cantillon changed 
the word to mean almost the exact opposite, and it stuck. In all the early uh, dictionaries after Cantillon, uh, we see the word meaning what it does today, and also very often quoted by students of Cantillon, readers of his book. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I understand uh, that Undertaker doesn't have anything to do with death and graveyards. Or That's correct. Somebody who undertakes an activity of some sort. That's correct, okay. but it's very unsettling yeah. you know, for a modern reader to <laughs> see that, that the Undertakers are in charge of everything. Yeah. I mean, I can think of some entrepreneurs who probably ought to be called Undertakers insofar as they're linked up with, say, bailouts. So, <laughs> That's correct. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, now, you had mentioned that Adam Smith actually quoted Cantillon in The Wealth of Nations. That's correct. He, he quotes um, Cantillon on the matter of par value between land and labor. Because, of course, value theory was all messed up in the early days and still is to a large extent. And uh, so Cantillon really uh, straightens out value theory for the early economist and introduces what we call today opportunity cost. Yeah. And for many years, people misunderstood Cantillon's value theory. And I was able to do some research and show that what he meant by opportunity cost is precisely what we mean by opportunity cost. And he used examples in his text that are very reminiscent of examples in modern text. He uses the example of the farmer making the decision of whether or not to send his child into a craft where you have to spend years learning how to do a certain trade and you lose all that time, whereas the, the, the son could have been working on the farm. So uh, it's precisely the modern definition. And Smith uh, references Cantillon. He read Cantillon. Um, he derived the invisible hand out of Cantillon. Of course, Cantillon did not use the term invisible mm -hmm. hand. And also David Hume read Cantillon. Uh, the physiocrats, of course, who helped get his book published, uh, Turgot read and references uh, Cantillon and also Condillac. That's so all the, all the early economists read him, although in some cases they didn't even know who they were reading because the book was published again anonymously. So you, you said he didn't use the word uh, invisible hand. Did, did he have some notion of a of a self-regulating society or a spontaneous order? Yes, he, he has a, a model of what he calls the isolated estate, where one man owns everything in the world and there's nothing outside of that. And, of course, the owner has to hire labor and direct them and so forth. And then he changes the model where he leases parts of his land to individual entrepreneurs who then – undertake to grow various crops and raise various animals and to make various goods and services, mm -hmm. uh, which are then priced on the marketplace. So he, he starts out with feudalism, where one person owns this massive estate, and then he develops capitalism by breaking it all up into individual pieces, creating entrepreneurs, prices, and markets. So he has a division of labor all worked out there? He, oh, absolutely. He, yeah. In fact, he, uh, he develops the division of labor uh, much earlier on than all of that. And, um, but in the, uh, as you get further into the text where he's, he's building this model of the invisible hand, he shows that, you know, if demand is reduced for a certain product, the price falls, the farmers have to adjust, you know, so you got the price system and you've got entrepreneurial adjustment, profit and loss, all the basic components of what we know of as the invisible hand. Yeah, that's, that's really remarkable. Um, it, from your description, it seems like his name ought to be added to the to the list of the the founders of of a uh, of a uh, classical liberalism. Well, he does. Um, he he pulls his punches in a lot of areas. Uh, he clearly doesn't like government, big government, taxes, uh, national debt, war, um, things of that things of those obvious natures. But mm -hmm. you'll find him very often. Um, coming to a policy conclusion and he'll say but that is beyond the nature of my subject yeah so he well, Mises says that sometimes too that's so, correct yeah. yeah he 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 stops um at various points where the positive scientific economic analysis yeah. ends and where the normative conclusions begin and he just stops it goes without saying i suppose that you consider him a predecessor to the austrian school well, no doubt about it. I mean, in fact, I wrote an article that's titled Cantillon as an Austrian economist. Yeah. 
uh, again, very much modeled on on Murray's work. But uh, uh, yes, I mean he's a he's an important influence. Uh, we know that Menger read him. He had a copy of the book. In fact, he had two copies of the book. One of which he gave Hayek, and that became very influential on Hayek's business cycle theory and Cantillon effects and relative prices and all that nature. Do you and of think course, that book will ever go for sale on eBay? Is there any chance? Of that? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, actually, actually, um, the copies of Cantillon's essay are so rare and tightly held that it's uh, the first edition is probably the most expensive book in economics uh-huh. uh, or maybe one of the most expensive books in the social sciences. Uh, uh-huh. There's currently only one copy for sale, and I think it's for over $65,000. So yeah. it leaves you know the wealth of nations and, and things like that in the dust as yeah. far as the resale used book market or yeah. antiquarian book market. It's, it's number one as far yeah. as I can tell. So your your new book is a little more affordable than that. Uh, well, you could speak to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, these aspects, the division of labor, all the things you're, you're talking about, um, are they clearer in your translation than in the older translation? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we, we do all sorts of things to improve the book and to make it more readable. Yeah. Um, the grammar, the punctuation... Yeah. Uh, the sentence structure, uh, we add uh, abstracts to all the chapters to tell the reader what they're going to get into in the chapter. We have explanatory footnotes for all the terms mm. and historical characters because, of course, mm. Cantillon's read everything that's available. Mm. Um, he's just talking about all of the economists of the day and criticizing their work. Uh, we add footnotes for various types of money and um, you know, just everything that the modern reader wouldn't be familiar with, we provide some explanation. Um, and then again, we also make some, I think, some important corrections in the original translation where Higgs leaves the essay um, either with error or with ambiguity. Um, and we painstakingly work through all of that with our various sources and, and try to make that as clear and as correct as we possibly could. By the way, this isn't entirely unusual. It's often the case that translation 2.0 is is the uh, necessary to gain a full understanding of a work of a thing, uh, somebody's work. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Higgs's Higgs's translation is what translators would call a literal translation, yeah. where he's just going word for word, sentence yeah. by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, and what you need for a, a fuller understanding from the modern perspective is more of a wholesale um, translation where you're really looking at what was the original author trying to convey right. and then rewriting it in that fashion. We're not writing anything new into them. We're just um, both updating it and correcting it so that uh, it can be understood. The Higgs translation, if you were to read it, you would be stumbling through yeah. words, uh, sentences, paragraphs, whole chapters, and just thinking you might get the true understanding. Yeah. With our translation, we're hoping it's going to be much easier for the reader. Yeah. You know, one thing we left out when we were talking about, about Cantillon himself is um, his influences. If you're going to name two or three uh, economic thinkers that had the biggest influence on his thought, who would they be? Well, that's a very good question. Um, uh, Lord Bolingbroke, uh, who was the Prime Minister of England, was a friend of his, uh, and a very conservative thinker uh, in favor of peace and free trade. And it's often said that his conservative values uh, were important for Cantillon. And then there were also some early um, uh, anti-mercantilist writers in France, uh, Vabon and Bouger Guibert um, and other people, I can't pronounce their names, um, who were not economic theorists but who wrote – on economic topics. And so when he discusses the English mercantilists, it's clear that he um, is in disagreement with mercantilist positions, that he doesn't like the English people in general, and uh, that he really highly is highly critical of their work. Um, William Petty and uh, Davignant and uh, Sir Isaac Newton, who was the uh, director of the uh, London Mint, uh, all very highly critical of those people, but with the French anti-mercantilist um, 
semi-libertarian writers who weren't uh, right on economic theory but on policy, he was very sympathetic. And when he said something negative about their work, he wasn't as highly critical in his tone. Mm -hmm. So he did have some influences. He was extremely widely read in uh, you know various disciplines in history, ancient history, right. um, economics, uh, agriculture, uh, minting coins. Just right. every every well, time you did have the emergence of a of a the beginnings of an economic system of economic theory growing out of that scholastic tradition in Europe. Correct, uh, and he did read the scholastics as well. Sure. So he's he's digging through all the old Latin treatises and. And putting a lot of things together, but but still, his work represented something of an intellectual uh, leap forward. Oh, absolutely! He yeah. did read the Scholastics because, uh, again, he was critical of them on a couple of points, although he didn't necessarily disagree with them. Right. Um, but again, they were you know sort of on the normative rather than on the positive side. Uh, but yes, there's a tremendous um, background that he brings to the table. But what he adds to the table is something incredibly significant in, in terms of developing economic theory. That was what was really the leap of advance. And that was really, I think, the what the contribution is. Would you say that his book could be read? Well, let me ask it this way. How would a modern reader respond to the text that you've produced? Well, that's a good question. Um, hopefully, they'll buy it, first of all. Yeah. And then when they read it, they'll, they'll realize um, that economics is a systematic, deductive, logical system. Uh, Cantillon was, was big on numbers and histories and dates and uh, testing out various things. But his economics and the development of economic theory is a logical, deductive system uh, where he demonstrates how he comes to various conclusions and why alternatives to those conclusions are illogical and don't really stand the test of anything. So you would say that the book is capable of, of serving as a, um, a, a an instrument of teaching? Absolutely. I think it's um, it absolutely you could um, teach economics to somebody from the beginning to the end. That's and right. and you'd get a good history lesson in the process yeah. and a history of thought lesson. Yeah. It would all be interwoven within this new translation, at least. Yeah. I mean, the old translation is fairly hollow, except for the fact that Higgs added some explanatory essays by Jevons and by himself yeah. that do provide some context yeah. and which we, of course, did use in developing the translation. Are there insights in Cantillon that Adam Smith... Um, well, he must have taken some of them, but some did. Did he overlook some as well? Oh yeah, that's um, that's clear. As a matter of fact, um, I've written an article explaining how the invisible hand comes from Cantillon, and uh, in doing so, I quote a number of modern scholars who who on all the various points say that Cantillon really got it right, and then Smith kind of either watered it down or didn't get it quite right <laughs> after funny. that. So. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty obvious to the leading scholars in all those various fields that Cantillon was much clearer, much more direct, and much more complete than uh, both Adam Smith and David Hume. A lot of people, I did this paper, you know, showing how Hume got his economic analysis from Cantillon. And then various scholars have debated it because they say, well, it couldn't be that way because Hume's analysis isn't as good as Cantillon's, and it should have been better, <laughs> well, that right? Because all of, the time, actually. <laughs> but they're, they're basically, yeah. uh, Smith and Hume were watering down yeah. Cantillon in order to appeal to a much wider audience. And, of course, uh -huh. Smith and Hume are famous for appealing to a very wide audience. Uh -huh. So um, I'm not blaming them or chastising or criticizing them. That's just the way they did things. Yeah. There were more popularizers, whereas Cantillon was more, would you say, rigorous or scientific? Very rigorous, and it would have been censored. I mean, if, if yeah. he had published it during his lifetime, they would have hunted him down <laughs> and threw him in prison. <laughs> um, so, yes, it, I mean, he was uh, fearless in, in, in the way in, that he was writing. Uh, he wasn't trying to appeal to the masses. Uh, he was trying to appeal to a very small group of 
the leading scholars of his day. And he lived in Paris amidst the leading scholars of the day. And he also lived in London amidst the leading scholars of the day. And so he knew Sir Isaac Newton and he knew uh, Voltaire and he knew Bolingbroke and a bunch of other people. You know, Montesquieu was a family friend. <laughs> Have him over to dinner. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, so, bizarre. so it, it really is bizarre, but, but, the mystery of Cantillon is that he's cut out of all these histories. You can read yeah. a two-volume set about Lord Bolingbroke's life, and Cantillon's never mentioned. Yeah. Very secretive, as any banker of the day was, yeah. um, and uh, was not a member of society, so he wasn't you know, officially in all of these uh, high society-type uh, organizations, but he was there. And now he you was can't, equal to all the greats of the day. You can't be the first uh, thinker in the history of thought who's taken up the cause of Cantillon. Are you one in a long line of champions? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, the um, and maybe the least in the line of all <laughs> these champions because, you know, William Stanley Jevons, one of the contributors yeah. to the Marginal Revolution, said, described the essay as the cradle of political economy. Oh, yeah. uh, Joseph Schumpeter thought that Cantillon was one of the greatest economists of all time. Uh, Spengler, the famous American historian of economic thought, uh, devoted a lot of his work to Cantillon and published two big articles in the JPE on it. And then, of course, Murray and uh, the Austrians uh, have made a big deal about Cantillon. So, uh, yeah, I think in Hayek, of course, thought it was important enough to translate it yeah. into German. So yeah. everywhere you turn and you look to the the real scholars in the profession and you find uh, – that they they place a lot of emphasis on Cantillon and and of course Bob Aber, who wrote the foreword for us, yeah. we're very grateful for that. Absolutely. He's a Cantillon scholar and a French economic scholar who's written on a variety of of, of French economists. Uh, he he told me that he thought that 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 there was a need for a new translation, and he actually mentioned to me that at a conference a, a number of years back that uh, he had discussed Cantillon and that afterwards uh, someone came up to him and commented on his work and said that there needed to be a new translation, English translation of Cantillon. And it turns out it was uh, Shackle who, who mentioned that oh. to, to Bear. So I think, um, you know, I'm the last to figure out Cantillon, not the first. And a lot of the very biggest and brightest stars of the economics profession uh, have all come to the same conclusion. Yeah. So, um, well, maybe you're the one to finally break him out of obscurity. Well, we've we've solved a lot of mysteries, yeah. and uh, I think we've brought something forth that the uh, even the general public will find a lot of insight in there. Because not only does he provide full and complete theoretical explanations, but he does so in a straightforward manner, um, and it's not all that long. I mean, he's covering yeah. all of economics in a fairly short period of time. He discusses wealth in chapter one, which is only one page long, mm -hmm. where he sort of blows up mercantil the mercantilist idea that money is wealth. And he does that all in just one page. So, well, I guess what we should be, we, we should be um, attempting, I guess over the next coming months, we should, we should run some excerpts of the book uh, in the Mises Daily, but the book is available free online under the literature tab at Mises Org, and then also in the store with a beautiful uh, cover design by Chad Parrish. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. I can't wait to get my hands on it. Yeah. <laughs> I know. We're all sitting around, where's the book? Where's was? the book? <laughs> <laughs> It'll be here Monday, surely. Yeah. I thank you for being with us here today and for giving us a great overview of this fascinating figure. Absolutely. My pleasure. <laughs>